Nina, hey, let's talk about phase three of the MCU. Okay, so basically, the second phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe went sliding into home with its pants all full of Age of Ultron foam. As a result, the feeling in the room was very much that audiences needed to focus on solo films and take a break from the Avengers movies. Legitimate. With that in mind, Marvel released Captain America Civil War. What was that about? It was an Avengers movie. Oh. Long story short, most of the Avengers have a contract dispute. Thor, Hulk, and Sam Jackson pursue personal projects around this time, on account of how any one of them could have put a bow on the conflict faster than Quicksilver catching a bullet with his sternum. What's the fight about? Captain America thinks that superheroes should be independent contractors, while Tony says that their actions should be transparent, subject to oversight, and legally defensible. Oh, how does Iron Man defend his position? By blackmailing a child, disguising his identity, and illegally smuggling him overseas. Uh huh. Everyone breaks up and Cap forgets to buy a razor for like two years. Speaking of, next up is Doctor Strange, a $200 million microdose of DMT about a man whose hands get squished so bad that he can't hold a fork, but somehow not badly enough to stop him from meticulously carving a magnificent Van Dyke. He starts wearing the flying carpet from Aladdin and learns how to conjure the plots of like four out of the next 14 movies. He sounds handy. Wait, is that ironic? I don't know. Moving on, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 continues in the grand tradition of the first Guardians movie by paying the mortgages of a bunch of singers from the 70s. In it, Star-Lord learns that his father, due to his rejection of society and willingness to kill to achieve his own ends, is bad. Oh, that's a shame. Then there's Spider-Man Homecoming, a charming throwback to John Hughes' pictures of the 1980s mixed with the homicide-capable youth of the John Hughes' pictures of the 90s. In it, Spider-Man learns that his girlfriend's father, due to his rejection of society and willingness to kill to achieve his own ends, is bad. Oh, that's a shame. And of course, there's Black Panther, in which T'Challa learns that his father, due to his rejection of society and willingness to kill to achieve his own ends, is basically alright, just sort of misguided. Oh, that's pretty interesting. But his cousin is bad. Oh, that's a shame. It, wait, what about Thor Ragnarok? Oh, right. Remember how Edgar Wright got canned from directing Ant-Man because he wanted to make something tonally unique and comedic? Oh, yeah. Right, well, Taika Waititi turned Thor Ragnarok into a synth-backed two-hour hybrid of Heavy Metal Magazine and Jack Kirby collages. Lo and behold, it's still one of the best movies in the Marvel stable. So it sounds like they got a good product just by trusting a talented artist to do what he does best and having faith that the audience would be smart enough to get behind it. This is gonna sound crazy, but that strategy kept paying dividends. 2018 saw the biggest franchise spectacle to date thanks to the Russo Brothers, the directorial team responsible for making an anabolic war veteran into one of Marvel's most interesting properties. Infinity War has everything. I'm intrigued. Is there a father who rejects society and is willing to kill to achieve his own ends? Less of a father and more of a daddy. The film opens with Thanos, a spaceman who looks like if Wreck-It Ralph had his head replaced by a California singing raisin. He kills Loki and Idris Elba and Thor's entourage on screen and Glenn Close while you're not looking. Sounds like somebody didn't get Glenn Close enough to the producers. Space Daddy wants all of the Planeteer's power rings, and he's got two of them by the time the opening title hits the screen. Iron Man and Doctor Strange and Wong and Spider-Man fight Frollo and Bad Ben Grimm to protect Doctor Strange's Planeteer ring, then most of them go to Jupiter. Also, Captain America, who'd been gone for a while, unceremoniously shows back up with a big beard and doesn't do much. Oh, what a sh thing to do to your friends. I bet he expected everybody to thank him for it, too. Probably. Great having you back, by the way. Also in space, Thor teams up with Groot and Rocket to go help Peter Dinklage jumpstart his car so he can make a new cosplay accessory. That takes up most of their screen time in a two hour and 20 minute movie. Sounds like it's some accessory. It's a rock on a stick, but yeah, it's whatever. Thanos has a competition to see if he can explode more scenery than Benicio Del Toro can chew, ending with Thanos winning another glow rock. Then he takes his kid to go see a Hugo Weaving impersonator, and he shucks her off a cliff. Yeah, celebrity impressions always make me cranky, too. With that, there's only two planeteer rings left, the one that Doctor Strange wears his necklace and the one that Paul Bettany keeps in his noggin. Most of the Guardians meet those other guys on Jupiter to try and stop Thanos from getting the necklace one, but Doctor Strange is like, trust me, I'm a doctor, and he gives it to Thanos anyway. Also, Iron Man gets Stark kebobbed. Oof. That's rough. Thanos isn't done yet, though. He travels to Earth, killing Vision to collect his brain rock and snapping away half of the population of the universe. Dozens of juicy IPs disappear in an instant. Spider-Man, most of the Guardians, but the worst is yet to come. What could be worse than that? Think Star Wars. Think back to the future. What's the cruelest move that a media franchise can pull on its heavily invested audience? I don't know, a cliffhanger that they'll have to wait a hopelessly long time to have resolved? It. Oh, God. Okay, so now it's time for Avengers Endgame, right? Tom, go ahead and hold your horses. Okay. Get a hold of those horses, pal. You gotta walk before you can run, and no movie took a walk quite like Captain Marvel, a film that asked, what if Nick Fury dropped a deus ex machina in the toilet back in 1995 and never bothered to fish it out of the U-Bit? And now it's time for Avengers Endgame, right? Oh my god, what are all these horses doing here? Why isn't anybody holding them? <sighs> 
just wish some responsible equestrian with good strong hands would get in here and hold these horses. See, you gotta take baby steps before you can walk, and nobody takes smaller steps than Ant-Man. In his second outing, Scott got trapped in time, Hope got a super suit, Hank got a new old lady friend, and audiences who skipped Ant-Man 2 got to feel confused when Michelle Pfeiffer showed up for 10 seconds in Avengers Endgame. So now it's time for Avengers Endgame, right? You know, it's a funny thing about horses, Tom. Nina? Most people think that they want oats and hay, but the truth is most horses just want to be held. Nina! I mean, we haven't even talked about Team Daryl yet. Nina, so now it's time for Avengers Endgame, right? Fine, yes, Avengers Endgame, the culmination of more than a decade of meticulous world building, tactful corporate maneuvering, and astonishing amounts of patience on the part of the audience for pithy, irredeemable white guys turning their lives around in their 40s. Thanos is alive, then he isn't, then he is because of time travel, which allows the film to take viewers on a carefully polished studio tour of memorable moments in the franchise. As with real studio tours involving stuff that Joss Whedon made, Joss Whedon is not invited. Hulk manages to do the impossible by combining his warring sides after years of torment, but still gets fewer plot beats than Captain America's little bottom. I'll salute those shorts. The whole thing culminates in a battle royale par excellence. Gods stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with soldiers, kings, and the world's brightest minds as the film's third act reaches its climax. This monumental sequence perfectly weaves a tapestry of breathtaking, edge-of-your-seat cinematic storytelling that Letterboxd user Joker Society 420 deemed, and I quote, 7 out of 10, the girl power seemed a bit contrived. Uh-huh. By the time the credits roll, Robert Downey Jr. gets to spend more time with his family. Scarlett Johansson makes history by becoming one of just two women to fall off something in an MCU movie and not have anyone catch her. And Chris Evans doesn't have to do push-ups anymore. And is that the end? Almost. Spider-Man Far From Home sets an important standard for things to come in Phase 4 by introducing the multiverse and then not being sure what to do with it, while also honoring traditional on-screen Spider-Man storytelling by putting a football in the shape of a father figure in front of Peter Parker and then cacklingly pulling it away just before he makes contact. Good enough. Hey, you mentioned Phase 4. What's that all about? Huh, that's a good question. Wakanda Forever was the last movie in Phase 4, so I'm sure they'll figure that out any day now. Oh my god. Oh, that was terrifying. Oh. Hey, Brian. Oh, that was the scariest shit of my life. How long was I gone? Yeah, honestly, I hadn't even clocked you as being, uh, as being gone. Yeah. Well, um, uh, do you, uh, do you guys want help making a video or something, or, uh... Nah. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Because I can help, you know, uh, like... Uh, no. Yeah, we'll catch you later, man. Call ended. Hey, honey, I'm back! Wait, who? Your husband, Brian!